we're going to start today uh, by looking at what we ended, or where we ended last time. So, you guys ready to go? Yeah. All right. Last time we were talking about using different methods of psychology, and we ended up looking at some correlations. Were there any questions about that? Any questions about, um, and, and, and I'll cover correlations in just a minute more specifically. Were there any correlations left undone, ones you want to know about the answer to? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, okay, I never explained the one about bottle feeding and breastfeeding and IQ scores. Is that right? Yes. All right, we'll cover that one today. Um, some of these um, we mentioned had third variables. When we talked a little bit in this class and we mentioned, or I mentioned a correlation that existed between vitamin use, for example, and increased uh, likelihood of using drugs, what was the third variable that was actually explaining that relationship? It's age. Age was explaining that variable. We talked about popsicles and drowning deaths. What was the third variable? It was heat. Do you all remember that one? Remember, there were a greater number of popsicles being sold. We can pr use that to predict more drowning deaths, but it's not because popsicles were causing it. But that's the nature of a correlation. They help us to predict things. So we're gonna explore that in just a minute. To get to that point, I wanna make sure, and what we're doing now is covering the methods of psychology. Uh, we'll talk about observation, we'll talk about uh, correlations, and we'll talk about experimentation. And then we're going to jump into the, the topic of, um, literally we're gonna look at the biology of the brain or the mind, neuropsychology, which is gonna be kinda cool, because we're gonna learn some interesting things. And we're also going to start why don't we do this? Why don't we start with a little bit of a, um, uh, maybe a trick that will help us explore what it means about intuition and, um, yeah, let's talk about intuition real quick. Um, and then I'll explain why doing the scientific method could be so important. Let me start with a story that happened. Um, how many believe or, or realize that uh, way back, even 350 years before the birth of Christ, Aristotle made an argument? I'll use a modern day analogy, but he basically said if you take um, two objects, let's take two <coughs> bowling balls. Some of you have gone bowling recently and you have those ones that are really light for young kids and they're, they're not very heavy. I don't know how much they weigh, maybe what, like four or five pounds? pretty light, and then you have a pretty heavy bowling ball, maybe it weighs 12 to 15 pounds, they're about the same size. Aristotle argued um, uh, 350 BC uh, that what would happen if we were to drop both of these balls, which one would hit the earth first? Aristotle argued that the heavier, the 12 pound ball, would hit the earth first. We believed that that's exactly what would happen. In other words, heavier objects will hit the ground before a lighter object, right? For 2,000 years, this was unquestioned. And it was wrong. Why is it wrong? Who figured out that that was wrong? Galileo figured out that two objects would not land at a different rate or be, w would drop at a different rate simply because they weighed differently. Galileo, Galileo showed that ultimately gravity works the same on every object. And it's gravity which is pulling these two bowling balls down and they will hit at what? At the same time. Do you know what that did for people for 2,000 years by the sheer force of the argument that Aristotle put forth? We believed intuitively that makes a lot of sense. If it's heavier, it hits first. That's not true. Gravity works on e forces equally. They're gonna land at the same time. It's like if I took a rifle and I set it up right here, let's say it's a 22 rifle, and I shot straight out a field that kept going and going and going. That bullet is going to land at the exact same time if I stood here, and the moment we pulled the trigger, I let go of a bullet at the same height as the rifle, and I let go of a bullet right there, it, that bullet is going to land at the same time as that bullet. 
That's weird, isn't it? The moment that bullet lands, that bullet is going to land way out there. But see, that's kind of weird for us, because intuition and human intuition works in kind of a strange way. And it was because of that that people realized we have to start doing some studies, some experiments, because human intuition can sometimes be messed up. We're going to try something right quick. I've got three envelopes. I need somebody who would like to try and win what's ever in this envelope. But I'll tell you what, just here we'll just randomly, because there's five dollars in here. So now everybody, will, I'll just randomly throw this. Does that sound good? Whoever gets it, gets a chance, come up, you get to pick an envelope. I, I, it's hard for me to, I'll just throw it this way. I should probably spin around first. Oh. <laughs> Where did it hit? Off that one. <gasps> that was awesome. The bar? I couldn't do that a hundred times more. Okay, let's try it again. Let's see if I can do it. <clears throat> okay, who was going to win the five dollars? <gasps> Would you like to win the five dollars, or you want to give it the, the ball to somebody else? You like to win? Come on up. Tell me your name. What is it? Hannah. Oh, Hannah. Hannah came up and asked me a question about her clickers just now, didn't you? All right, Hannah, come on up real quick. You're going to pick one of three envelopes, and we're going to try this very quick, understanding of the scientific method and how important this is. So, Hannah, got three. <sighs> Hannah, right? I have three envelopes, right? There is probably no, I'm gonna use this and just, well, it doesn't matter. Three envelopes. Um, you get to choose one of these envelopes and you are going to help me with your clickers in just a second to help Hannah. So I'm gonna randomly just kind of shuffle these around, okay? As I do that, she's going to pick one. I want you to be thinking about her odds of winning the $5. Got it? All right, Hannah, here we go. Take your pick. Huh? Not that one. Huh? No, no, yeah. Huh? Okay. All right, don't look at it. You go, go back to your seat. All right, now let's try something. Pull out your clickers for me. Hannah has an envelope. I want you to answer this question real quickly. I want you to answer the question for me. Um, well, let's do it, we'll use the clickers. There are, okay, so there are three envelopes, two are empty, and one has $5 in it. Student Hannah took one of the envelopes. I am now going to do something. It says, I am going to take one of the envelopes, uh, open it, um, and now we'll each have one, and then we're going to offer Hannah a chance to switch envelopes or stay, okay? And so what you're going to do is eventually vote, and so, so it goes like this, ready? I'm gonna take this envelope here, and I know something. I know $5 is not in this envelope, okay? So I'll set this here. I'm gonna open this envelope, and what's gonna happen, if all works out well, there's nothing in there. All right, I took that envelope. I have an envelope, Hannah has an envelope, and we're going to give her an opportunity, and I want you to use your intuition and tell me what do you think Hannah should do? Should she keep this envelope? Should she um, switch? And here's how I'll start it real quick, and you get to vote for me, and the way it works is, I'm gonna, so I'm gonna offer her this chance. She could either keep hers, okay? You get to switch with me, uh, and then, or it doesn't really matter which one you do. And so let's let everybody vote. Should, should Hannah, uh, you would say A, if Hannah should stay, keep her envelope and don't, don't switch. B, you think Hannah should switch, or C, it really doesn't matter, both of them have an equal chance of winning. And I'd like to do is to demonstrate um, something very quickly and very importantly when it comes to the way we, we think. Humans rely on intuition to make some decisions. They took this, by the way, this little envelope trick, it's called the three envelope thing, and they've sent it around to all kinds of people like you, and they begin to find something very interesting happening. 
People begin to pick something, one of these answers, I'm gonna put up your answers in just a second, this is before I've told you anything about it, and this is kind of based on what you would do, what you would feel, what you think, what your intuition is, what the right answer is. If you really wanted this $5, what would, what would happen? So let's, I'll just go ahead and click in where you're, all, where you're at. Let me get my glass. And then, all right, we'll end it here. So at the end of the day, and Hannah, I want you to pay attention to this because as soon as it ends, we'll see the numbers and what they said. <gasps> and 105 people said you should stay, keep your envelope, don't switch. 83 said you should switch, that's the lowest. And 190 said it doesn't matter, both have an equal chance of winning. All right, that's where you're at as a class. The vast majority of you are wrong. <laughs> Your top two choices are wrong. And here's why. So I'm gonna argue why you believe, first of all, there are 105 of you, let's start with the most. How many, let's, let's start with the 105. Why should student X stay and not, why should Hannah stay and keep her envelope? Somebody argued for that. You would, so, so what would happen is if you pick the right one and then you switch with me and then you open it up and you don't have the five, I do, she would feel horrible. You made a choice. Stick with your choice. Huh. She'd have to walk back up. <laughs> <laughs> There's some social pain in getting up out of that chair. She had to walk up. It was hard. It was painful. It's embarrassing. And it's just not worth five bucks. I'm going to stay with my envelope. By the way, that's the wrong answer. <laughs> Come on, give me somebody else that, that says A. You, have, you put it for a reason. Nobody else? What if I said it was the right answer? Well, I thought that, why well, I, I did agree with C, but I thought that like C wasn't really like an action. Oh, there wasn't anything she so, could do with C, yeah. so you just picked the next yeah. available one. All right. Come on, anybody else, real quickly. Sometimes you ought to just, maybe, you, 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 she picked that one for a reason. It's trust your instincts. Yeah. Trust your intuition. What are Hannah's chances of winning? She has 33% chance of walking away with five bucks. If we did this study 100 times, and every single time Hannah stayed and she didn't move, she's going to win five bucks what percentage of the time? 33% of the time, I don't know what that is times five, but it's like a hundred and something dollars. If she stays with her choice because she's gonna get it right 33% of the time. Some of you said it doesn't really matter. Why do, why do you say it doesn't matter? The vast majority of you said this. Why does it not matter? We'll do this real quickly, come on, give me. Because between the last two, there's one 50 /50. Oh, there's only two left. It's either one or the other. Either she has the five or I have the five. It's 50-50, it doesn't matter. 90% of PhD students and those that have a degree argued for C. 90% of people that were grad in a graduate program and or already had the PhD argued for number C, including a faculty member here one time when she presented this, he goes, that doesn't matter, it's 50-50. And he was wrong. But you're gonna ask why. How many think, it, uh, you, 190 of you said it doesn't matter because listen, she, it, it, doesn't that make sense? I've got an envelope, she's got an envelope, don't we have 50-50? Yeah. The answer is we don't have 50-50. And that's the crux of the issue. That's where intuition breaks down. She doesn't have a 50% chance, she has a what percent chance? 30. She's got a 33% chance. How many, what percent chance do I have? And I took one and opened it and showed you there was nothing in here. What, what? What odds did I have when she picked one, she had a what? 33, what were my odds of having the right one? 66, what are my odds right now of having the right one? They're 66, they're not 50. You switch, you're gonna walk away 66% of the time with five bucks. 33% of the time you're gonna mess up. Are you tracking? 
The key moment was when I took one and opened it, showed there was nothing in there. This stays, it does, just because I opened one doesn't change my odds. My odds stay 60. Her odds never change. They don't all of a sudden go 33 and then, oh, he opened one, now they're 50. <laughs> if there were two, she'd have 50-50 chance. If we just simply had her choose between two. She didn't choose between two, she chose between three. Does that make sense? By the way, the smartest person in the world the smartest person who scored the highest on any IQ test, they asked her this question. Her name is Marilyn Vosavant. She had the highest score ever on an IQ test. She beat me by one point. <laughs> it was a tough day for me. I went, oh man. No, and, uh, she is the highest score ever on a personality inventory according to the Guinness Book of World Records and she, they gave her this problem and they said, what would you do? And she goes, ah, oh, switch. You have a better chance of winning. All right, make sense? Did I convince you? If I didn't convince you, then here it is, ready? Let's go to the next question. And the next question goes like this. After hearing the research on this problem related to switching or staying, what would you do now? <laughs> And you get to click in. A, some of you would say, well, I would stay and still keep my envelope because frankly, I, I wasn't paying attention to anything you said <laughs> and I don't really agree with you. B, you would say, no, nah, I would switch and C, I still believe they have equal chances of containing the $5. And then we're going to see what this is and then we're gonna present this to Hannah and we're gonna ask Hannah to make a decision. Hannah, would you like to see what people told you now? All right, ready? Here's what they said. You all have to keep voting. There's still some of you that don't want to vote. And, I'm, I, and I do this illustration for this reason. I think it's a great one. I think it's about intuition. It's how we think. And then I'll talk a little bit about why our intuition is very valuable when we come up and think about and hypothesize and dream about or see connections. But it also can lead us into some odd places with some decisions. And so ready? Here we go, about 300 of you clicked in. That's very interesting. Some of you still, I don't even know where my glasses are, I have to use these. So 70 of you said you would stay, 243 said you would switch, yes. And 58, uh, again, are saying, you know, it doesn't really matter what you said. <laughs> Anna, it's now the moment. You saw the research, you heard what I said, you saw how 240 or some odd classmates said they would do that. You get a choice now, I'm gonna to offer to you the opportunity to keep your envelope or switch, what would you like to do? And you don't even have to get up, I'll carry it, I'll bring it to you. <laughs> You'll switch. Did she make the right move? No. <laughs> See, this is really hard, give me that. And I, I, should I open mine or should I let her open hers? Her. Hannah, what do you want to do? Let's do it together, come on, open it up. <laughs> There's nothing here. <laughs> All right. Since this was just an uh, in class, I need, I need the money back, by the way. That was, that's not, no, no, it's yours. She, she, that's yours. That was awesome. If you would have switched, I mean stayed, I would have gotten the money. The problem with intuition isn't that it's wrong all the time. The problem is sometimes we're led astray and we need to figure out a way to do something to help us avoid this kind of natural bias, this natural tendency to miss some things. If I would have asked you before, when I said that you shoot this rifle that way and which bullet hits quicker, I'm sure some of you, gosh, I don't know, it seems like this one would hit quicker. Because that goes a long way. But we're kind of missing something and we tend not to use this a lot. And so every time we hear about an experiment, I want you to think critically and go, my intuition says this, but that doesn't make sense. Just because people spend time and had chewable vitamins and the research is showing a relationship, intuition says, well, gosh, 
Well, it's just two different groups, those that had this and those that didn't, and they have more drug use, that makes sense. But there's something we're missing each time in these, and I believe when we do experimentation, ultimately at the end of the day, what we're able to do is try and, and start to figure out, ah, maybe there's something to this. So, the way, oh, I have to hit end and close. We'll hit close, great. So now we'll do it this way, ready? Ultimately, we have to start, we're gonna, I'm gonna give you three different methods. I already gave you the first one, which is called observation, right? Observation provides for us this ability to describe what's happening. So observation leads to description. And that's the first key valuable point. And this is kind of where we ended last time. But we're going to begin to add on top of this. What it does is, when I start to observe things, I can get some ideas about the way the world works, some, uh, some ideas about even, even me, ready? There's some things I can learn about myself just by studying a small sample of people. I could watch, for example, a kid. Maybe you work with kids. You can watch them over time and get a sense Maybe about maybe you watched a group of you know a couple of little boys and a couple of little girls and you watched them over the, over time because you worked in a Sunday school class or a school or you volunteered somewhere and you and you can go you know what just in watching this small sample I can tell you that boys are a little bit more active than girls when they're four they're riding their tricycles and they're bumping into each other and the girls are sitting there and it, oftentimes they're sometimes they're riding bikes and bumping into each other but oftentimes there seems to be a little bit of a difference. It's a case study method. You're looking at a small number of people develop and grow over time, and from that you're making a description, what we call observation. Very helpful, very good. Um, there are some cool things about using studies like this. We, a similar kinds of observational method is something called the case, or the survey. A survey is just simply somebody going out, asking questions of people, doing a survey monkey, doing it in a mall. Someone comes up and asks you questions and you find out some things about people. They did a survey um, in a neighborhood, not unlike the neighborhoods around here, and they went and they knocked at doors of people's homes with a quick survey and they said, when someone answered the door that looked like they were 18 or older, they said, I'd like to ask you a quick question. Um, how much beer do you drink in this household? Because you just were trying to look at how much beer is consumed and how many, let's say, bottles or cans do you consume on a regular basis in this particular week of time. That was a survey, and they found some answers. Okay. People admitted, and I have the numbers right here for you, it's kind of a fascinating little tiny study, and it said when they did this survey, they found that people admitted to drinking beer, and the percentage of time was, let's see, anybody want to take a guess? What percentages of, home, what percentages of homes admitted, and how much did they drink? Take a guess. What percent? Of 100% of the homes, how many admitted to uh, consuming uh, alcohol or beer? High number? 90%, 50%, or 20%? Ultimately, at the end of the day, they find out, found out that, let's see if I can find it because I want to give you the right data, they showed uh, <gasps> beer consumed and admitted I can't find it. Oh, here it is. And the answer was <laughs> in thirty seven percent of the homes. Is that high or low? That's low. The average, by the way, of those 37, said they, they uh, consumed on average five total beers that week in that home. Does that seem high or low? That seem low. Okay, so that's a survey. You can now use your kind of intuition and think, by the way, why might that low? Why might that be low, according to some of you? What, 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 would, what would cause that number to be so low when people responded that way? Maybe it's a middle class neighborhood and you might find differences in upper class neighborhoods or lower class neighborhoods. 
Oh, it's not anonymous. What does it be, not being anonymous mean? So, oh, the person there is going, I, uh, I know who's saying this. So in other words, the person answering the question feels not anonymous. What does, what, why would that influence things? Do you think people might lie? Huh, interesting, okay. There might be, um, like, if they, somebody that's coming to, like, to their job, depending on how much they drink off the job. And, like, oh, so someone who, who, same thing, he said somebody um, uh, is not anonymous, and so this person might be thinking to themselves, gosh, this is a way somebody might be checking up on me because I'm not supposed to be drinking alcohol anywhere in this house. Or maybe I have a job that doesn't, okay. Uh-huh. The amount of people in the home that can drink. Oh, so... Uh, uh, so there's other variables that could come into play, like if there's five adults that live there versus one adult or two adults, and so you know, then there's going to be less. Is that what you mean? Uh huh. So that have an influence. It was very specific to beer instead of like. I don't oh. Know, it could have been like wine. Sure. And so it's it's kind of a specific thing if they're only asking for beer, which is all they were doing, and uh, then that would seem a little bit odd or weird that maybe there's more alcohol consumption. You can't really say much about that other than just about beer consumption. Okay, so here's what happened. They took this study, they found it, they heard about the results, and intuition told them what? Intuition told them this seems a little low. So what they did was this. They went out and they started something very different. What would you do if you wanted to do a naturalistic observation about this? How would you go about and determine whether or not you were actually being correct in this study? What would you do? Somebody give me, uh, give me an example of something that you would do which might help you determine whether or not this was being accurate. So here's what it was, it was even, I just found the study. <laughs> How long does it take a guy to find a study like this? <gasps> it wasn't 30%, it was 15%. 15% of the homes admitted to drinking and the maximum amount was eight cans a week. So I kind of mixed that up. 15% admitted to drinking. How much beer do you drink each week? 15% admitted to and eight was. And so what would you do if you wanted to go out and study this? Go look in their recycle bin. Oh, go look in their recycle bin. <laughs> That's a little bit awkward. Or you could go to like the liquor stores and the uh, you know, supermarkets and check beer sales. By the way, you could do both, they've done that and they went and they checked the trash cans and recycle bins. And they found beer behind, not 15% of the homes, but ready, behind 77% of the homes. 15, 15 cans was pretty average for those cans in which they found it. But, does that tell you the whole story? No. What could be wrong with that? There was a party next door and the people just took all their beer cans and spread them out throughout everybody's recycling. <laughs> yes. There was a party that weekend because there happened to be a big game and everybody was over there watching and it wasn't the people in the house, it was all the guests that came over. Last night the people across the street from me were watching Sunday Night Football. There are at least 15 people there, cars, and my guess is they, were ha they had beer cans, all kinds now. If you went out and looked in the recycle bin, you're going to find beer behind that home and that home. Probably because, in this home over here, because they had a big little party. Or a big little, a party. <laughs> Does that now tell you the answer? Okay. I tell you all of this just simply to say that observation allows us to describe some things, and it's pretty helpful. But there are oftentimes issues or problems we might want to search on. So, observation leads to description. The way people try and figure out if there's a stronger relationship is to look at things like correlations. A correlation means, and, and literally the word means connected, co-related means connected, co-related, connected together. So a correlation means literally a, a relationship between two variables that are somewhat connected could be variables like traits or behaviors, and these traits and behaviors vary together. They vary together. If you find one going up, the other one's connected to it. It varies and goes up as well, or maybe it goes down. But somehow, if one goes up, the other variable either goes up or it goes down depending upon this one. So, first one, ready? Popsicle sales go up, drowning deaths also vary with that, and they do what? They go up. 
but you can also find something in which one variable goes up and you'll find another variable goes down. Someone one time said that that's a, what we call, by the way, a negative correlation, one that's completely opposite. Someone says, your love of God goes up like this, then your love of money is going to go down. <laughs> and the opposite occurs. As soon as your love for money goes up, your love of God goes down. They're completely negatively correlated. Make sense? They're related. Now, the key part to all of this that we have been early on studying here is that just because two events are correlated doesn't tell us anything beyond prediction because, by the way, two variables that are correlated lead us to predict. If you show me a bunch of kids that have had breastfeeding versus bottle feeding, we're going to find higher IQ kids in the, bottle, in the breastfeeding group than in the bottle feeding group. Why? By the way, we're also going to find, go ahead, go ahead, you want to answer it? Bottles could be breast milk or whole milk. And so bottles could actually be either full of breast milk or bottle milk. There are some moms who just simply pump and they put breast milk in there and they feed the baby, and so it's not really the breast milk. Hmm. It probably means that the mom wasn't present the whole time because she'd send the kid off with someone in the bottle feed. There may very well be lots of other variables in this, and just to bring it to a conclusion to say why there's a relationship there at all is because it's a correlation, but it doesn't mean that breast milk has something magical in it that causes kids to be smarter. It's probably better for kids in some ways, but then again, over years and years, they find so long as the mom and or the dad or the significant other in this baby's life was present and available and interactive and provided a nurturing environment, that relationship went away. Does that make sense? If the mom, the dad, or the other that was there raising this child was present, it didn't matter if it was breastfeeding or bottle feeding, so long as they were engaged with the, the, the baby. Too often, bottle-fed babies might be associated with having mom or dad or, or somebody else not as present in their life. And that lack of a nurturing environment might lead to lower IQs. Does that make sense? So there could be variables that kind of have other things that come into play that confound this relationship. It's like this, if you told me your foot size, or you gave me the foot size of a person, I could predict their vocabulary. Smaller foot size, smaller vocabulary. There's a correlation between foot size and vocabulary. Somebody tell me why that exists and why it goes away if, if somebody's over the age of 15. Why does it go away? Yeah, it goes away over the age of 15. It's because why? If you gave me, if you told me a foot size is this tall, I'm going to tell you that, that vocabulary of that person is probably like about 10 words. <laughs> Mommy, daddy, no, stop, go, bad, yuck. But it gets bigger, they start to increase. And so vocabulary is associated with foot size until about 15. Then what happens? And then, then you can have, then I can't tell you, an adult foot size, they can have any kind of vocabulary. Make sense? All right. Correlations are very helpful, but what they do not do, besides leading to prediction, what they do not do and cannot do, and the error you should avoid making, is that it indicates only the possibility of cause and effect. It doesn't prove causation. That's important, okay? Correlations indicate the possibility of a cause and effect. They don't <coughs> prove causation. The only way we understand cause and effect is to use an experiment which holds constant variables like age or when they were born, and then we'll get a better sense of what's really causing the relationship. So if we did this study and we, we for a vocabulary and foot size, and we controlled for age, we would find no relationship but an experiment would help us control for that. And so to do an experiment ultimately is the way we get around some of the limitations of human intuition and correlations which don't imply cause and effect. Now, let me just say this. There are some correlations that are really strong and they've been validated lots of different ways. Give me an example of a correlation that is so strong, we've seen so much evidence of it happening, and so many different studies that have been done, we're pretty certain that variable is close to a cause and effect. 25, 30 years ago, there was some debate. They used to say it was a correlation between smoking and what? 
smoking and lung cancer. It was only a correlation. Why is it just a correlation? Because I can't, I can't do an experiment. I can't take half of the population and say, you go smoke for 10 years, you don't smoke, and we'll see who comes up with cancer. It's not ethical. I, can't, I don't have that kind of control. So all we were relying on were studies that kept showing over and over in different ways they control different variables, and they kept finding a relationship between smoking and lung cancer. And so today, after probably I, I would imagine it's close to 40, 50 years of studies that have looked at different variables that might intervene, that might confound this, that might explain it. It all goes away, and today we now say we believe smoking causes lung cancer. It's a correlation, initially, that eventually we could get to a causative state, but it takes a long time. Does that make sense? All right. So we do an experiment, and I, I, I'm just going to, what we talk about with experiments is ultimately hold these variables constant that are inter influencing like age or weather or behaviors that we're not really measuring. And instead, we want to manipulate, change, explore, look at the factors that are being studied. By the way, how easy is it for people to fall into the trap that correlations imply causation? Very easy. Lady wrote me a, a letter to, my, to our family because my, my, when our kids were at a school that had school uniforms, she wrote this letter back and it said something to the effect that school uniforms um, uh, are having kids do better in school, they show up on time, they, um, uh, they, they have better test scores, they have less of a problem when it comes to um, discipline, and so she wrote, our school, this is from the superintendent of a school district, our school uniform is really effective. In surveying, we found school sites that have a high degree of implementation, in other words, these schools all have a uniform policy, but some of the times they wear it and sometimes they don't. There's significant improvements in areas of discipline, attendance, and academic focus when school, in other words, the schools that have higher rates of, uh, of kids wearing their school uniform have better discipline, attendance, and academic focus. So we believe these are effective and, and you should keep wearing these. What she kind of started to fall into, I believe, was this whole idea of correlation uh, not implying causation. But she's saying, D by the way, do you think school uniforms cause kids to have better focus, better discipline, and higher test scores? If so, what, 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 what's in the uniform? <laughs> what would, so you need to be think, you think about that correlation. What variables would come into play there? Why might there be a correlation and why is that not a causative thing? Go ahead. Not me? Sure. All right. Um, uh, 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 schools that yeah. tend to have uh, uniforms, they tend to be kind of like the higher class private schools. Ah, so maybe when you have schools that have higher uniforms, or, or wear uniforms, they have a higher level or, or a higher um, test scores to begin with. Yeah, exactly. Upper class or whatever. Better access. Go ahead, uh, John, sure. Yeah. Way back there, go ahead. Okay, so well, I'll come to you next. Hold on, sorry, yeah, I'll go back there and then I'll come to you. I'd say the majority of schools that are Oh, so maybe there's a private public school problem here, the majority. By the way, how many were in a public school and you had to wear school uniforms? As like in elementary or junior at some point. Public school, school uniform. How many public school, no uniform? Hmm. How many private school uniform? And private school, no uniform? Ah, that's pretty good 50-50 rates. I don't know, kind of close, maybe not. There might be something, okay, now go ahead, sorry. You were gonna say. Oh, I see. So on free days, when you didn't have to wear the uniform, you call them free days or whatever? Free dress days. Yeah. Free dress days. And so you get to wear whatever. People were like always curious about what other people were wearing. More focused on that than the actual And they were focused more on that, and that might have distracted them and did some other things. It's a very interesting thought. Yeah, go ahead. Uh huh. Did you say parents or kids? Parents. I'll tell you what, let me show you the answer to this one. The answer to this particular correlation has everything to do with one variable. Schools that have higher 
area, uh, higher focus, better test scores, and higher levels uh, or better levels of discipline are almost always associated with greater parental involvement. It's parental involvement. The more parents are involved, the better the scores are on tests, the better the areas of focus and discipline the children are. And probably because of parents more involved, if, if you have a mandatory school dress policy, if parents are involved, their kids are probably what? They can't leave the house not wearing the uniform. Yeah. In schools in which there's a mandatory dress policy, but the kids don't wear it, that's low rates of following the policy. Because the parents are like, whatever, what are you supposed, you're supposed to be wearing a uniform. Yeah, but I'm not going to. Oh, okay, whatever. <laughs> Does that make sense? Lower parental involvement probably means kids are less likely to follow the rule of dressing in the uniform, and they're not. And that one variable right there, parental involvement, oftentimes explains the relationship between those variables and school related to school performance. But we could do this by, if you wanted to study this to find out, is there something interesting about wearing a uniform? Maybe it's social. Maybe there's something about it. Maybe kids feel better about themselves. Maybe something about a uniform makes, make, makes teachers teach better or students learn better. You could randomly assign a group of kids to, um, you know, uh, wear a uniform or not wear a uniform. And so you just take a group, I don't know, maybe you, you know, a couple of hundred students and say, you guys are gonna wear a uniform this whole year, you guys are not, we're gonna see the difference. That's called random assignment. You randomly put students into one category or another. Then an independent variable. Um, uh, this independent variable uh, is a factor or variable that you manipulate, that you change. In this case, we're manipulating or changing a person's, in the variable of whether they're wearing a uniform or not. Um, this independent variable is something that the is under the control. When I say that you manipulate, the, that the person running the study manipulates. So they change the variable of whether they wear a uniform or not. And then what are we going to measure? We're going to depend, that, that, that is hopefully the dependent variable is what we measure. And what are we measuring? We could measure like test scores or academic focus, or we can measure whether or not there's higher or better rates of discipline. Um, and that's something that might change depending upon whether they wear, wear uniforms or not. And if that's the case, then we'll just simply look at, and we'll have two groups, those that are wearing the uniforms, those that are not wearing the uniforms, and there, those that are wearing uniforms, let's say, are in an experimental group, those that are not are in the controlled group. These kids are exactly alike. Otherwise, then we go and we measure and see how did their test scores show up. The experimental group's test scores, if they're higher and we controlled for everything else, then we could say, wow, we controlled for all the variables. Like parents were involved in both groups. They showed up on time in both groups. These kids were equally smart when we randomly assigned them. And we measured, the dependent variable was we measured their test scores and if at the end of the day there's a difference, we can then say, gosh, this study shows that wearing a uniform causes kids to do better. In this case, you're probably going to find it doesn't have an effect if all the other variables are kept constant. That is the basis of a simple, straightforward, kind of two-condition experiment, but it starts to help us get some insight into human behaviors that we can kind of start to fall prey to maybe to some intuition or correlation issues, um, and then we can start to um, find what really is going on here in this, if it's something um, that we can study or not study. Okay, does that all make sense? All right, so I'm gonna leave this chapter real quick. After you write all this down, see if you have questions. It's pretty straightforward. Um, what I'd like to do is spend some more time now um, introducing um, the next section, uh, uh, next chapter, but before I leave chapter one, how you do psychology, how um, some of the different things we've covered, are there any, any outstanding questions from that? Something you're wondering about even on this topic? All right, all makes sense? All right.
Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.